for about 45 minutes, that's okay. Uh, on all these sort of creatures, so in many beasts, and also I'm going to do a little bit on some of the reptiles and amphibians, because they, they don't usually get a mention, uh, but they are out there uh, for us to find in the meadows. They can give them all sorts of habitats, but meadows are one of the important habitats for them. I'll just give you a brief introduction to myself for those who don't know. Uh, I live in Buckersley with my wife Joyce and our youngest son Oscar. Our eldest son lives in Germany, and uh, he's actually currently in the land of the midnight sun. I spoke to him the other day, he's in northern Iceland at a folk festival, which is uh, I'm a bit jealous of that because he's uh, enjoying the sunshine up there in 24 hour day there. Uh, I've been interested in natural history ever since I was tiny. Uh, I've always had a passion for wildlife ever since I was three years old. I was really interested in passionate about exploring the natural world through the drawing and painting and more recently through photography and video. This is me out in the garden. I do take a lot of photos but I never draw from photos. I always draw from the living creatures. So this is me out in the garden sketching some wool carder beans. Just to say I was actually doing three talks today. I've just finished talking about this at Buckfast Abbey at the garden event there. I'm um, moving on to do another talk this evening at Manager Farm. So I use these illustrations in a number of ways. Uh, I uh, choose a little sketchbook section for the Garden Magazine in each, each issue, in Nesting Tree Creepers. Uh, I've recently illustrated a book, which isn't out yet, it's a sneak preview really, of a book by Bridget Strawbridge uh, called Dancing with Bees, which will actually be launched at More Meadows events in September at Ashburton. Uh, and uh, this is a, a red book, and it's a beautiful book, really very well written, very easy to read. And I had the pleasure of producing the illustrations for that. Uh, I've uh, recently made some of my illustrations into cards. I have got some in the car, actually, someone's interested in buying them. Uh, and I, as I said, I've recently uh, started using uh, digital photography, actually, probably about 10, 15 years now. Uh, and currently I use these two cameras, and, uh, a Canon SX60 bridge camera, a 65 zoom lens, really good for macro stuff and for bird, uh, birds as well, and uh, a little Olympus Tough TG5 camera, uh, which is really good for macro insect stuff, you know, it's a fantastic little camera, very, very good. Oops, that was an example of a picture, I think. Now, uh, this is a, uh, I'm just throwing I went to see, uh, some of you may know Stephen Falk, uh, the bee, bee man. He was doing a course at Slapton on Sunday, and I met up with him after the course and uh, went down to crawl. And I've recently been taking lots of high speed photographs of insects, and I said, you know, you have to take thousands of shots to get anything decent. I went down to see the longhorn bees. I took 10 frames and I got that one. I thought, well, I'm going to give up. Okay. <laughs> uh, I also worked as an ecologist. We were out in the A38 uh, last summer in that heat wave, uh, looking for bugs along the uh, road verges there. And I did a lot of work on this spider, the horrid ground weaver, okay. the rarest spider in the world. It's only found in two or three sites in Plymouth <laughs> and in the whole world. And only 131 actual spiders have ever been seen. And I've seen pretty well most of those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I recently, you may have seen on Friday, I was on the One Show. I've been lucky enough to work with TV companies over the years. Uh, we made a film with George McGavin at Warren House Inn uh, on uh, Good Friday, actually. We made a film, it was shown last Friday, and it's still on the iPad. It's right at the end of the program if you don't want to you know, watch the rest of it. Quite bizarre. Do all of this and make this really new uh, film. So now I'm doing it, and then grind them. Introduces it, you'll see it if you watch the program. If you know, if you know the writer, uh, so that's the, uh, the TX culture. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to my dad who died two weeks ago, which was speaking at his funeral yesterday, which is a lot harder than doing these three talks today. Um, so into the meadows now. This is uh, a lovely meadow I know, it's uh, Bobwell Cottage. Anyone who knows that secret little meadow is a very, very special place. And uh, one that this time of year, if you go there, you can, actually one of the few places you can go and guarantee to see the narrow border bee hawk moth. It's one of the most fabulous insects as it whizzes around the meadow looking like a bee and feeding on the bluebells that are out at the moment and the last works, and there's a bit of bugle in there as well. The mother Shipton moth, another day flying moth which you can find in the meadows, and actually in quite a few meadows around the moor, and species rich meadows you find this moth. It's uh, called the mother shift because it has 
there's the little button. So you see the face has two witches' faces. You see there the witch uh, <laughs> talking to each other over the leaves of the moth. And uh, the chimney sweeper moth. Now, if you wander in through the meadows uh, where you have pig nut, which is the larval food plant of this moth, you'll see these sooty back moths with little white tips to their wings uh, fluttering through the grasses. I uh, haven't seen any yet this year, but they're a little bit late this year, the pig nut's a bit late coming up. Uh, but if you look, so probably if you look now on the pig nut, you'll find the caterpillars. They feed just under the flowers. If you look carefully where you have good numbers of uh, chimney sweepers, you'll see these caterpillars, very well camouflaged. And these are the ones I reared, the female moth, and took her back to the meadow, and uh, this is a Kevin's meadow, and uh, they attracted the, uh, the uh, female, in, uh, the male in to make the female. Um, after now, pinup was just disappears you know, at the end of the end of the year, um, shrivels up, and there's nothing left until the next spring. So the moths don't lay their eggs on the food plant. The, the caterpillars don't hatch until the spring. So the moth, female moth, just literally sits there, and just the eggs just drop out of the body, mm. and they go down into the grass, and then they they'll emerge in the spring, and presumably walk around to find some pinup. Mm. Small couple of butterflies, again, for a manner in the way that Kevin showed you a little bit uh, Lovely to go there in the, in the late summer, particularly last summer when we had such a good weather and the small coppers really loved the, those long summers. So they have three broods and there are enormous numbers of them feeding on the water near them. Fantastic colours, particularly in the autumn light. In the edges of the meadows, uh, planting things like older buckthorn. Uh, if you do that, you almost certainly attract this butterfly, the brimstone. One of our longest lived you know, butterfly, as an adult butterfly. Some species, uh, silver studded blues and things, just live for two or three days, whereas this one lives for nearly a year, certainly 11 months as an adult butterfly. Uh, it hibernates, looking like a dead leaf uh, over the winter, and then they come out in the spring, and this is. Uh, if you catch this, they do this, the males have this lovely display where they flutter behind the females. You see the females will fly on and you often get two, sometimes I've seen up to five males fluttering behind the female. This was at age tour, just at Newbridge. Mm -hmm. And they, they seem to have had a really good year actually, because they're absolutely masses of brimstones around. So if you do have some on the buckthorn about, you almost certainly get these butterflies coming in. I was watching them there. The females egg laying, it's quite easy to watch them egg laying. There are hundreds of eggs on the older buckthorn in that area. And even if you look on older buckthorn now, you'll find the eggs. They're easy enough to find little pale eggs like this, but there are lots around. And if you look at a few weeks' time on the older buckthorn, you might see a few little nibbled leaves and look carefully, and there's the stunningly camouflaged caterpillar of the brimstone just sitting on the midrib. They mainly feed at night, you know, they, the movement will give themselves away, so they, they sit tight during the daytime. Fox moth caterpillar. Uh, these uh, caterpillars feed on a variety of plants, heathers and uh, various other low-growing plants. And they're important food for the cuckoo. Uh, cuckoos, one of the reasons for the cuckoo's decline is the fact that cuckoos are specialised in feeding on hairy caterpillars. And the, although the distribution of these species of moths hasn't changed a lot, the actual density of the, of the populations has, has changed enormously. So in lowland areas of Britain, uh, lowland moths are still there. So you look at the distribution map and think it's much the same. The numbers have declined by about 90% easily. And that's, I'm sure that is a major factor why the cuckoo has disappeared from those areas. The cuckoo is adapted, it, it can actually feed on hairy caterpillars and it can shed the lining of its stomach every now and again because the lining of its stomach traps all the hairs in the caterpillars. Lovely flower rich meadow, uh, really lovely. And so I'm always amazed at how quickly these meadows appear. You know, in April, there's not much happening really. And then suddenly it will burst into life, you know, this time of year, especially on a day like that. And they're full of uh, the sounds, really, of the meadows. You know, just uh, <coughs> one thing about enjoying meadows is just going out and just lying down and sitting in them. And one of the most evocative things is, of course, the sound of grasshoppers you know, chirping away, oh, grasshoppers and crickets. That's really evocative of summer. <coughs> That's the meadow grasshopper. Now, the reason you, the way you tell grasshoppers and crickets apart is by their antennae. So, if you look here, grasshoppers always have short, thick antennae. And, uh, and crickets, this is a great green bush cricket, a nymph, 
They also have long antenna, which are almost always longer than their bodies. So that's how you tell bush crickets and grasshoppers apart. Um, and this is another one of the common, this is a, a cricket, of course, with a long uh, antenna. This is a dark bush cricket, one of the commonest species. You hear it. It, it, it survives well into the year. These are some sketches I did in early November. Uh, so it was last into November. And it's the classic sound of like autumn days, the sunny autumn days. You hear this little sh tiny little call in the hedges, and that's the, the call of the dark bush cricket. I often rescue them at that time of the year, actually, and just keep them in a tank at home because the frost will kill them off. Um, and they will survive, they have to have them survive until February. And it's quite nice around Christmas time. If you put them in a tank, it's uh, best, best just to keep males because if you put females in there, they will get hungry and eat the males. And they just collect males, keep them in a tank, feed them on bits of apple. They'll sit there chirping away, so I just put them in my office and they're like, it's the sound of summer, just around <laughs> Christmas time. <laughs> Uh, as well as grasshoppers and bush crickets, there are ground hoppers. They're sort of one of the lesser known of this group, and they're tiny little things, about a centimetre long, very common. Uh, you'll find them in meadows. Uh, this one is the common, common ground hopper, which likes dry, sort of fairly sparsely vegetated meadows, but you also find them in gardens, uh, any, anywhere where there's low sparse vegetation. And this one, the slender gra uh, ground hopper, and this will occur mainly in sort of marshy, wet meadows. It likes a bit of mud. Uh, and these can fly around uh, uh, around the uh, mud hatches. They're about a centimetre long, as I said, and uh, they feed on the low-growing mosses and algae. Uh, they're unusual as the uh, the grasshoppers and crickets will die off at the end of the summer, but these the ground hoppers actually hibernate as adults, so they're adults at the moment, and then they'll lay eggs, which will develop over the summer, and then the new adults will emerge in the late summer and early autumn, and then they'll hibernate. So the grasshopper, this is uh, grasshoppers lay their eggs in the ground. Uh, this is a female meadow grasshopper laying her eggs, uh, digging her body into the ground. And she lays a, a little batch of eggs, which will then uh, hatch the following spring. The bush crickets, uh, they also, the feet, the, another way of telling bush crickets, if they're female anyway, is they have an ovipositor on the end of the body. And so this is a female great green bush cricket laying her eggs deep into the soil. Uh, with many species, like the great green bush cricket, they actually take two years to develop, so they won't, won't hatch for until the second year. This is probably because they're really warmth-loving insects from down in, that, in southern Europe and in northern Europe. Uh, it takes two years for those eggs to develop. And then in the springtime, you get all the little, this time of year, you get all the little hoppers around. They're not so easy to identify, but you can tell if it's a grasshopper or a cricket uh, by the antennae. There's a little meadow grasshopper and there's a miniature dark bush cricket. And this is another one. This is a, a grasshopper-sized cricket, but uh, you can tell it's a cricket. It has a long ovipositor, long antennae, and this is a long-winged conehead. Uh, they could name, right? And it's, uh, it used to be quite a rare species, but it's spread across, uh, in the last 20 years, spread across uh, southern England. It's now found quite commonly around Dartmoor. And it's quite easy to tell as a nymph. When it's, when it's a small, in its younger stages, it has a, a very dark stripe along the back of it. Uh, there's two species, there's a short-winged and a long-winged conehead. The, the one we get in the meadows on Darnwood is a, is a long-winged conehead. And, they, and the little, tiny little hoppers always have a dark stripe along the back. So they're quite active, but it's easily identifiable. Another species, the speckled bush cricket. Quite an unobtrusive little cricket. It doesn't make a, a call that we can hear. Uh, you can pick them up with bat detectors, uh, but uh, they're very, very, there's very, very high frequency call they make. And uh, they're very well camouflaged, you can see. There's the female on the right, and the male on the left, with this sort of brown and green camouflage. It's a speckled bush cricket. Uh, and it's uh, more speckled, actually, when it's a nymph. So this time of year, they're often on um, bits of wood sage they seem to like, uh, and roses as well in gardens. But if you're out in the meadows, if you've got little patches of wood sage, have a look on those, and you may well see the little speckled bush crickets this time of year. This is an oak bush cricket. Uh, it doesn't just live on oaks, it lives on a number of uh, bushes and shrubs. Uh, and it flies as well, flies mainly at night, and it may well come into lighted windows at night. It looks a bit like a green lacewing type creature. It's a lovely, delicate little insect. The oak bush cricket. Now, grasshoppers and crickets 
uh, are actually quite, there's not many of them in Britain, there's only a handful of species really, and, it, and on Darwin, you know, it's even, even fewer. So they're actually, although many groups have beetles and bees and things, you know, it might be a bit daunting to actually try and learn them all. Here, it's actually quite easy to learn them all. And also, like birds, they have particular calls, the songs of the males, which immediately identify the species. So, uh, if you, uh, I mean, I, I've, got, I've got a little ID sheet, which I do, if anyone's interested, just drop me an email, I'll, I'll send you a little guide to learning how to identify grasshoppers and crickets. It's good fun, it's a real pleasure to actually now just walk through a meadow and uh, just be able to hear what's there, uh, rather without ever seeing any of any the actual insect. So we have got one member of the true crickets in this country, in Devon. Uh, it doesn't live in the meadows, it's the scaly cricket. And this one just lives in shingle at Branscombe. It lives in the upper strand line of the shingle, a very hostile environment. And that's a very, very rare insect in Britain. And related to grasshoppers, uh, these are the lesser known creatures, the cockroaches. Uh, cockroaches are much maligned, thought of as pests really. And there are actually three native species of cockroach. They're tiny little insects, very, very fast running as all cockroaches are. This is one of the commonest ones which you're likely to find in dry meadows around Dartmoor, the lesser cockroach. See there, it's a, 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 a thing there. very difficult to photograph it because it's like off like a rocket. So you have to wait till late summer when it's cooled down a bit to try and actually get a shot of one. Um, and also earwigs are related to grasshoppers and crickets. So uh, this is a Earwigs are very good parents, the, uh, particularly the females, they will look after the eggs right through the winter and then uh, look after the baby earwigs after they hatch in the spring before they're too big and then they eventually wander off to go their own way. And this is a, an unusual, there are several sorts of earwigs, this is about our smallest which is the lesser earwig and this is in compost heaps and piles of old you know, rotting vegetation so if you have any of those around your meadows you could well have these worth, worth searching around in there, see if you can find a lesser earwig. You can see it's a tiny little, little creature. <clears throat> Having a look at some of the other inhabitants of the meadow, this, you get down close and personal with these things, they're, they're real monsters down there, aren't they? This is a, a nursery web spider, and you see these at this time of year, uh, carrying the females, carrying their eggs around, you see them actually, whereas the wolf spiders carry their eggs on the tail end, See lots of those running around. The nursery where the spiders carry them in their jaws and cups. And eventually, when the eggs are ready to hatch, they'll spin a little nursery web, put the egg cocoon in there, and then all the little spiderlings will hatch out to regard them before they're big enough to disperse. And glowworms, of course. Now, glowworms, one of the, again, one of these things that used to be just widespread across southern England, but now uh, with uh, changes in uh, land use have just disappeared from many areas. The Dartmoor is still a good area for them. Um, they have a two-year life cycle, so they start off as a, a larva uh, like this. Looks a bit like an overgrown ladybird larva, and they feed on snails and slugs. So they feed up for two years, eating uh, eating snails and slugs. They can digest the uh, suck and dry sort of in insect insert to digest the juices into the slug, and then suck out all the insides of the slug or the snail. Then from any time from about now onwards, the peak time is sort of end of June, uh, mid-July time. Uh, the adult glowworms will emerge. They don't feed as adults and they, they don't live very long. Uh, this is a male. And the adult glowworms was a beetles, so he does look a bit like more like a beetle than the female, I'll show you in a minute. And you see there he has enormous eyes. It's under his little carapace there, so he gigantic eyes. And it has this little carapace over the top of them. And it's thought that this is to block out any light coming down from above. So as he's flying over the ground, he can look for this, the light of the female. And that's why he's got those giant eyes, because he's got to detect this faint glow in the grasses. Now, the females will emerge just after dark. I mean, it's pretty late that time of year. You have to go, you know, go out at half past 10 and, and look for the glowworms. Uh, they're all in the meadows, uh, places so the heathlands as well are good for glowworms in Devon and the, and the coast park as well. Uh, places like Bubby Heath, Aylesbeer, uh, Chubby Knight and Heath are good spots to see in Henbury Woods uh, and a number of other sites. So the female we put on a glowing disco tail and attract the male in and you see there the enormous eyes of the male. So he'll come in and mate with her 
and then after mating, the female will lay her yellow eggs in the soil, and then after a week or so, she'll die and leave those eggs to develop for the new generation of glowworms. Other beetles of the meadows is one of the commoner ones, the, one of these soldier beetles, the black tipped soldier beetle, which you often see on hogweed flowers in the summer. You can many lots of them all sitting on the flowers. So these are one of the real common inhabitants. There's several other species, but that's the easiest one to identify because it has the black tips. All the others look much the same. That's <coughs> uh, a malachite beetle, beautiful little beetle with red tips to its uh, wing cases. Very common in the meadows, and these are around at this time of year. And if you look on docks, it won't be long before you find these dock beetles, a uh, type of leaf beetle. Uh, beautiful metallic green beetles, and you can often find their eggs as well on the underside of the dock beetles. This is a dock bug. So this is uh, again a, a large brown bug. They hibernate as adults. You often get them clustered on docks in the autumn, and then they'll emerge. Emerging at this time of year, they'll lay their eggs, and then the nymphs of this this species will develop over the summer. And there's a whole host of other bugs. Uh, there's a site called, uh, a website called UK Bugs, which is a very, very good website if you, have, if you don't know that, um, which is a name, which is a photo, extensive photographs of all the bugs found in Britain. And many of them are, are, are easily identifiable from photographs. So they're a nice group to study. But there are lots of them. This is one of the Nuri bugs, uh, quite beautiful little creature. And another type of bug, the cuckoo spit or frog hopper. Uh, lots of cuckoo spit around at this time of year, and if you delve inside there, you probably did when you were kids, and they did with a bit of grass, you find a little green hopper, a little nymph, which uh, sucks the plant sap and then froths it up to make a little frothy home to live in. And uh, a little bit later, when the adult uh, frog hoppers emerge, they, they can, they've got a hardened wing case to make them fly as well, and they flip around. Scorpion flies, again, these are flying at this time of year. Uh, beautifully marked um, pattern wings. The males have what looks like a scorpion sting on the end of their body. It's, they, it's, they're completely harmless to us. Um, <coughs> sorry, did I have a question? Oh no, I don't know. <coughs> Yeah, it looks quite a ferocious creature, but it's actually completely harmless to us. Uh, there's three species in Britain, um, and you can tell them apart by the wing pattern uh, of the, uh, the wings, and also some markings on the top of the, of the sting of the male. Ladybirds, 14 spot ladybirds, because there's a myriad number of ladybirds which are flying, being in all sorts of aphids uh, and other small creatures in, in the meadows. And these things, which are really flying at the moment, you can't really see them. These are these swollen thigh beetles, and they're all over the place at the moment. Everywhere I go at the minute, I see hundreds of these beetles flying around. I'm not sure why the males have these great big chunky thighs. Uh, the females have uh, just have normal looking legs, but the males are really <laughs> And of course, the may bugs are pop trapers, uh, which are flying this time of year. And um, if you run the moth trap, they don't fill the moth trap. Nice time you catch them. Not always. Oh, oh, well, so yeah, I usually you get bombarded with these. Mm -hmm. I've seen quite a few around this lately. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're great fun to uh, if you get them out the day, just pull them up a bit and they'll take off in your hand and fly off. And another, it's a lesser known beetle, but a favourite one of mine. Uh, it's called a pill beetle. Feeds on mosses, although it's a bit of an obscure little creature, you might not notice it once you through the vegetation. And even if you did disturb it, it just immediately clamps its legs in and they all slot perfectly into these little grooves underneath. And it just looks like a seed. So it's an absolutely fabulous little creature, the pill, bark, pill beetle. I mean, it's quite common, but difficult to spot. Bees, of course, uh, you know, wherever you've got flowers in the meadows, in the first of Trapple Hill, you will always attract lots of bees, bumblebee, red-tailed bumblebees, and common carla bees in this case. And earlier in the spring, uh, there was just, it's about 270, or they're keep adding to all the time, it's probably about 280 bees now found in Britain. And uh, there's a succession of different species which fly through the year. Uh, in early spring, there's a lot of mining bees, these Andrina, 
mining bit. It's one of the most beautiful, the Tawny mining bit, uh, which uh, will take some such as getting little volcanoes of like the structures of soil appearing on lawns and in uh, open areas and meadows. And we'll find these are the nests of mining bees. So you sit and watch the bee might come in and you can see which species it is. A lot of them look the same, to be honest, but this is one that is absolutely instantly identifiable. <coughs> Dandelions, of course, early in the year, really good for all these uh, spring flying bees. They absolutely love that. They, they peak their emergence in the spring to coincide with this flush of flowers, uh, early spring flowers, and particularly dandelions, they absolutely love. Um, whether it's in a big meadow like that, or it's a little verge in Exeter, uh, anywhere they can leave where there's you know, get some flowers in there, dandelions in the spring will all provide extra food for bees. And with a little <coughs> the male and green, and the males have little, little fluffy moustaches. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And this is a female uh, orange tail mining bees. Again, there's about 60 species of, mine, of Andrina mining bees in Britain. You get quite a, quite a good number of them on Dartmoor because we have these ancient meadows which are largely undisturbed and so lots of food for them. There are also some things which look like bees aren't actually bees. This is a hoverfly uh, which mimics bees. Its larva lives inside bee nests and it clears up all the, the remnants of the nest at the end of the season. And it's, a, uh, it's like a volucella, a bombolens it's called, a little hoverfly. Well, I found a larva in an old uh, bumblebee nest, a tarver bee nest last year, and this is, I kept it, it's rather ugly looking grub, but it emerged into this beautiful hole, right? <laughs> and there's uh, various other things which follow uh, mining bees around, solitary bees. This is, a, <clears throat> this is a solitary bee going back to her nest, which is followed by a little fly, so that will be offer a fly, and this one will home in on the bee, follow it around, go back to its nest, and when the bees come out of the burrow, the fly will sneak in, lay her eggs, and then the, egg, the larvae of the uh, fly will eat the contents of the bee's nest. And the same with this fly as well. It's a more friendly looking one, but it does a similar thing. The bee fly, with its big long tongue, it throws around the primroses. But this one flicks its eggs into the ground near where sultry bees are nesting. And then the larva emerges, crawls into the bee nest, sits by the larva of the bee until it's fat and full grown and then it clamps onto it and sucks it dry. So the bees have evolved with these parasites, so you know they're well able it's a whole community of creatures. It's just there's a bunch of crooks in there and the and the hard work of the bees. <laughs> Same with this one, the oil beetle, which does a similar thing. Uh, it's a violet oil beetle. They vary a lot in size. Uh, because they're kleptoparasites of bee nests, so they, you know, it depends how much food there is inside the bee nest that the larva gets in, to how big the beaver can grow. Uh, they, there's two species which we get on Dartmoor, the violet and the black oil beetle, although the names don't really always make sense because that's a, that's a violet oil beetle, they can be all black and uh, vice versa. Um, the real way of telling them, there's a, there's a guide online, a bug life guide online, which I, I did for them. Um, is to look at the, the shape of the thorax there. So the, the violet oil beetle has this little tooth between the thorax and the wing cases, a little section with a tooth on it, and that's lacking in the black oil beetle. That doesn't have that tooth there. There's also another species which used to occur in Darwin, and it may well still do, called the short necked oil beetle. It was thought to be extinct for many years, about 60 years until Bob Peckford. Uh, and his, his lepidopterist found it down on the coast at Baldwin Down a few years ago. Uh, but I've been looking at it for, for years, and there's quite a few records from around Dartmoor. So uh, if you see any small, small oil beetles, and if they've got straight antennae, it's worth taking a closer look at them. But it could be one of could be this species, the short necked oil beetle. Now, oil beetles, unusual, they lay, they can lay thousands of eggs, so up to 40,000 eggs the female can lay. Uh, and under the ground, and these, uh, depending on the life cycle of a particular species, will hatch either within the, uh, the following year or after a few months. And they hatch into these larvae, which are the triangulate larvae of these oil beetles. And there's the five British species. They're actually easier to tell apart by the larvae, even though they're tiny. So the black, so the violet oil beetle on the end there has black larvae, and then the, the um, black oil beetle has orange larvae. So they're easy, quite easy to tell. Although they're only two and a half to you know, about one and a half millimeters long. 
and the rarer species have really tiny larvae which are about half a millimetre long. But again, they're, they're, if you find the larvae, it's actually quite easy to identify under a microscope. Really. And these will wait on flowers, they'll climb up onto flowers and they'll hitch a ride on bees. So there's one sitting on the back of this mining bee here, or actually two or three sitting there. And the bee will try and get them off it, um, but uh, if they can hide on that bee and get back to the nest, and they can jump off and then they can eat the contents of the bee's nest and develop into an oil bee. Yeah, it's a close cut view of the, uh, the triangle, and that's the violet oil beetle triangulins. They're called triangulins because they have three hooks on each foot. Uh, people up in Barton used to call them triangulin, you can say that, but it's actually triangulin, as in uncus in the book. Uh, there's there, this, this beetle, a cardinal beetle, will actually uh, suck the poisonous uh, or toxic juices out of oil beetles. Oil beetles produce a substance, toxic substance called cantharidin. That's why oil beetles just wander around on the paths and things, and they're, you know, they're not really frightened of anything and eating it because they're, they're highly toxic. But beetles like this cardinal beetle know this, and if they find an oil beetle, they'll jump on the back and suck out some of these toxins and enhance their own uh, chemical defences. <laughs> it's also, so that's what I really love about this, these things, because they've been on the planet for so long, so many millions of years before they were even dinosaurs were even thought of. They've had these amazingly long time to develop all these amazingly complex relationships. And that's why I find really fascinated about exploring the, the natural world of these creatures. There's some wasps flying around some ivy. The ivy is, of course, a really important plant to have late in the summer, uh, providing food for all sorts of creatures. Uh, this summer of you, you'll see things which look a bit like wasps, but they're actually beetles, because there's a lot of mimicry goes on in the insect world. This is a, a wasp beetle, and these are around at the moment, I'm seeing quite a few at the moment. Uh, they walk a bit like a wasp as well, uh, but closer look, you can see uh, they are actually beetles. They can fly. Uh, but they, and they often, uh, the longhorn beetles generally feed as larvae in dead wood, and these ones quite like to live in old fence posts, posts and places like that. Sawfly, these are relatives of the bees, uh, more primitive relatives. Um, this is a, a rather lovely green sawfly, which uh, you'll find quite commonly around Dartmoor. Uh, there's all sorts of different ones, some which look like wasps, some which look sort of like little black flies. Uh, quite a, a difficult bunch of species to actually identify, but they are fabulous things to look at. Yellow iris, if you have a wet meadow with yellow iris on it, have a look in the springtime. You may see little lines that have fallen down the leaves, and these are little flea beetles, the yellow iris flea beetle. Again, flea beetles are a nightmare to actually identify. If you just have the beetle and you're like, oh, that's that. But because they have associations with certain plants, that makes it, makes it instantly identifiable to anyone. You can see that's a, a yellow iris beetle. Another cool little beetle, a tortoise beetle. Uh, there's a, a number of, a few species of these. They're often found, some of them are found on thistles, some on flea bane, and they are they have little uh, tortoise shell sort of uh, carapaces over the top. Uh, this is the flea bane tortoise beetle. Uh, it's quite common wherever you get flea bane. Uh, it turns red uh, um, this one time of year. It's green. Yeah, it's green in the autumn. In the autumn, and then it turns red as it hibernates over the winter. So the ones you find in the summer year and the spring are red with the same black markings. And then the larvae develop on the flea vein over the summer. And this is a fig wort weevil. A fig wort. Have a close look at it because you're about to find these little amazing little weevils. Uh, we love these sort of little scaly tufts on there on their uh, body with white marking. And uh, this is a soldier fly, uh, relative to the uh, hoverflies. Uh, they're a beautifully coloured metallic one. This is uh, one of the common ones. It hasn't got any English name, but I think uh, Chloromia formosa. It's, it's common in pretty well every meadow you go into, you'll find, find these soldier flies. Uh, another group of flies, again, I don't know a huge amount about flies, uh, but I like to look at them. Look at one, sorry. Okay. Uh, picture wing flies and a giant crane fly. Uh, the hornet robber fly, uh, one of our largest flies, about two centimetres long. 
and uh, dragonflies, of course. Uh, they, although they live in there, so they will come and hunt in meadows where there's a rich supply of insects. Frogs, just finishing off looking at the amphibians and reptiles. So frogs are often laying their eggs in puddles, and like this, they get very shallow puddles with the frogs spawn in that. Uh, I've replicated this in our garden by providing uh, very shallow pools where newts can't get in there to eat all the tadpoles, but that's what they do. And that's why frogs go into really shallow water. So the frogs, uh, breeding season, of course, early in the year, uh, they'll come into the ponds and the males will intercept the females. They'll hold on to them using their big expanded thumb pads at this time of year. And then you see there a big black thumb pad. And then uh, they will have a big mass spawning and then the tadpoles are developing. They're just getting about full grown now. I was looking at some of Top Pass Abbey in the pond there this morning. Uh, this is the frog, mainly active at night, particularly on Dartmoor where there's buzzards and things which will eat them. But in gardens, they're active in the daytime as well. Newts, as I said, are predators of the tadpoles. If they'll move into deeper water, they'll clean out all the tadpoles in the springtime. Uh, the tadpoles like to bask in the, in the shallow water as well and develop quickly. And you see now they're just about getting to the point where they're starting to grow their legs at this time of year. Uh, newts, as I said, newts can you know, live out of the water during the winter. They'll, they'll go out and hibernate. They look a bit like lizards then, but they've got this little orange palmate newt, which they, the palmate newt is the commonest newt on the We do get, occasionally get smooth newts and a few great crested newts around as well. But the vast majority of newts you'll see around here will be palmates. Uh, toads, of course, they will travel quite long distances from their ponds and they will certainly feed in meadows during the summer, anywhere where there's a rich fire insect. Back on the in our, our garden and our garage. So encouraging reptiles into your meadow. Uh, this is a, a, you can find information on this online about building a hibernaculum. Uh, basically it's uh, some sort of logs and bubbles and uh, building up a, a, a mound in a, in a sunny sort of situation is best. This is one on uh, Bubby Heath, that you can know by the Wildlife Trust. Uh, and this will attract, it has lots of little crevices and holes in it where the reptiles can go in there and amphibians as well and hibernate over the winter. Things like lizards, of course, which uh, like uh, nice sunny grasslands. The common lizard one. And slow worms, of course, which are a type, of course, of uh, legless lizard. Slow worm. And there's a very fat female, pregnant female lizard. Uh, so, and they give birth uh, late summer to uh, the little baby slow worms here, beautiful little golden creatures. Uh, grass snakes, if you have wet meadows, you get grass snakes coming in, feeding on frogs and amphibians, other amphibians. Uh, they do like the wet patches and they can swim readily. And I'll just finish off by talking about adders. I mean, adders are you know, reasonably widespread, mainly on the heathlands, but they will occur in dry grasslands and, and damp grasslands as well. Uh, they give birth in late summer to, to live young. They emerge early in the spring, shed their skins, and the males with this beautiful blue colour. The females have emerged at that time of year. And then this is the mating season for adders, usually around early April time. And they do this thing called the dance of the adders, which is a wrestling match between two males. If they have a, one male is guarding a female, another male will come along and they'll have this wrestling match. So I'll just try and finish off by a quick time to the work. I'll show you a good video if you don't mind. This is uh, uh, to something with Whitakin. Wow. Yeah, it's quite a special thing to see. You need to find a good place for adders and then just stake them out and watch them in the springtime. And then just for a few days, as the first warm spell of the year happen, comes along, you'll get these dances taking place. Wow. We saw it very briefly this year. It's quite, it's quite. Hypnotizing thing to watch. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's the blue colours in the mouth, and it is just one of those fascinating things. That you just, once you've seen it, you will see it again. And again. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody there there. These big ones. They also move in this weird way, in this strange, sort of jerky way at this time of year. 